section zero of madame chrysanthème this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. madame chrysanthème by pierre lotti translated by laura ensor section zero dedication to madame la duchesse de richelieu madame la duchesse permit me to beg your acceptance of this work as a respectful tribute of my friendship i feel some hesitation in offering it for its theme cannot be deemed altogether correct but i have endeavoured to make its expression at least in harmony with good taste and i trust that my endeavours have been successful this record is the journal of a summer of my life in which i have changed nothing not even the dates thinking that in our efforts to arrange matters we succeed often only in disarranging them although the most important role may appear to devolve on madame chrysanthème it is very certain that the three principal points of interest are myself japan and the effect produced on me by that country do you recollect a certain photograph rather absurd i must admit representing that great fellow eve a japanese girl and myself grouped as we were posed by a nagasaki artist you smiled when i assured you that the carefully attired little damsel placed between us had been one of our neighbours kindly receive my book with the same indulgent smile without seeking therein a meaning either good or bad in the same spirit in which you would receive some quaint bit of pottery some grotesquely carved ivory idol or some fantastic trifle brought to you from this singular fatherland of all fantasy believe me with the deepest respect madame la duchesse your affectionate pierre Lotti introduction we were at sea about two o'clock in the morning on a fine night under a starry sky eve stood beside me on the bridge and we talked of the country unknown to both to which destiny was now carrying us as we were to cast anchor the next day we enjoyed our anticipations and made a thousand plans for myself i said i shall marry at once ah said eve with the indifferent air of one whom nothing can surprise yes i shall choose a little creamy skinned woman with black hair and cat's eyes she must be pretty and not much bigger than a doll you shall have a room in our house it will be a little paper house in a green garden deeply shaded we shall live among flowers everything around us shall blossom and each morning our dwelling shall be filled with nosegays nosegays such as you have never dreamed of eve now began to take an interest in these plans for my future household indeed he would have listened with as much confidence if i had expressed the intention of taking temporary vows in some monastery of this new country or of marrying some island queen and shutting myself up with her in a house built of jade in the middle of an enchanted lake i had quite made up my mind to carry out the scheme i had unfolded to him yes led on by ennui and solitude i had gradually arrived at dreaming of and looking forward to such a marriage and then above all to live for a while on land in some shady nook amid trees and flowers how tempting it sounded after the long months we had been wasting at the pescadores hot and arid islands devoid of freshness woods or streamlets full of faint odours of china and of death we had made great way in latitude since our vessel had quitted that chinese furnace and the constellations in the sky had undergone a series of rapid changes the southern cross had disappeared at the same time as the other austral stars and the great bear rising on the horizon was almost on as high a level as it is in the sky above france the evening breeze soothed and revived us bringing back to us the memory of our summer night watches on the coast of brittany what a distance we were however from those familiar coasts what a tremendous distance End of section zero. Section one of Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Lotti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book one. Chapter one. The Mysterious Land. At dawn we beheld Japan. Precisely at the foretold moment, the mysterious land arose before us, afar off like a black dot in the vast sea which for so many days had been but a blank space 
at first we saw nothing by the rays of the rising sun but a series of tiny pink-tipped heights the fukai islands soon however appeared all along the horizon like a misty veil over the waters japan itself and little by little out of the dense shadow arose the sharp opaque outlines of the nagasaki mountains the wind was dead against us and the strong breeze which steadily increased seemed as if the country were blowing with all its might in a vain effort to drive us away from its shores the sea the rigging the vessel itself all vibrated and quivered as if with emotion chapter two strange scenes by three o'clock in the afternoon all these far-off objects were close to us so close that they overshadowed us with their rocky masses and deep green thickets we entered a shady channel between two high ranges of mountains oddly symmetrical like stage scenery very pretty though unlike nature it seemed as if japan were opened to our view through an enchanted fissure allowing us to penetrate into her very heart nagasaki as yet unseen must be at the extremity of this long and peculiar bay all around us was exquisitely green the strong sea breeze had suddenly fallen and was succeeded by a calm the atmosphere now very warm was laden with the perfume of flowers in the valley resounded the ceaseless whir of the cicalas answering one another from shore to shore the mountains re-echoed with innumerable sounds the whole country seemed to vibrate like crystal we passed among myriads of japanese junks gliding softly wafted by imperceptible breezes on the smooth water their motion could hardly be heard and their white sails stretched out on yards fell languidly in a thousand horizontal folds like window blinds their strangely contorted poops rising up castle-like in the air reminding one of the towering ships of the middle ages in the midst of the verdure of this wall of mountains they stood out with a snowy whiteness what a country of verdure and shade is japan what an unlooked-for eden beyond us at sea it must have been full daylight but here in the depths of the valley we already felt the impression of evening beneath the summits in full sunlight the base of the mountains and all the thickly wooded parts near the water's edge were steeped in twilight the passing junks gleaming white against the background of dark foliage were silently and dexterously manoeuvred by small yellow naked men with long hair piled up on their heads in feminine fashion gradually as we advanced farther up the green channel the perfumes became more penetrating and the monotonous chirp of the cicalas swelled out like an orchestral crescendo above us against the luminous sky sharply delineated between the mountains a kind of hawk hovered screaming out with a deep human voice ha 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 its melancholy call prolonged by the echoes all this fresh and luxuriant nature was of a peculiar japanese type which seemed to impress itself even on the mountain tops and produced the effect of a too artificial prettiness the trees were grouped in clusters with the pretentious grace shown on lacquered trays large rocks sprang up in exaggerated shapes side by side with rounded lawn-like hillocks all the incongruous elements of landscape were grouped together as if artificially created when we looked intently here and there we saw often built in counterscarp on the very brink of an abyss some old tiny mysterious pagoda half hidden in the foliage of the overhanging trees bringing to the minds of new arrivals like ourselves a sense of unfamiliarity and strangeness and the feeling that in this country the spirits the sylvan gods the antique symbols faithful guardians of the woods and forests were unknown and incomprehensible when nagasaki appeared the view was rather disappointing situated at the foot of green overhanging mountains it looked like any other ordinary town in front of it lay a tangled mass of vessels flying all the flags of the world steamboats just as in any other port with dark funnels and black smoke and behind them quays covered with warehouses and factories nothing was wanting in the way of ordinary trivial everyday objects some time when man shall have made all things alike the earth will be a dull tedious dwelling-place and we shall have even to give up travelling and seeking for a change which can no longer be found about six o'clock we dropped anchor noisily amid the mass of vessels already in the harbour and were immediately invaded 
we were visited by a mercantile bustling comical japan which rushed upon us in full boatloads in waves like a rising sea little men and little women came in a continuous uninterrupted stream but without cries without squabbles noiselessly each one making so smiling a bow that it was impossible to be angry with them so that by reflex action we smiled and bowed also they carried on their backs little baskets tiny boxes receptacles of every shape fitting into one another in the most ingenious manner each containing several others and multiplying till they filled up everything in endless number from these they drew forth all manner of curious and unexpected things folding screens slippers soap lanterns sleeve links live cicalas chirping in little cages jewellery tame white mice turning little cardboard mills quaint photographs hot soups and stews in bowls ready to be served out in rations to the crew china a legion of vases teapots cups little pots and plates in one moment all this was unpacked spread out with astounding rapidity and a certain talent for arrangement each seller squatting monkey-like hands touching feet behind his fancy wear always smiling bending low with the most engaging bows under the mass of these many-coloured things the deck presented the appearance of an immense bazaar the sailors very much amused and full of fun walked among the heaped-up piles taking the little women by the chin buying anything and everything throwing broadcast their white dollars but how ugly mean and grotesque all those folk were i began to feel singularly uneasy and disenchanted regarding my possible marriage eve and i were on duty till the next morning and after the first bustle which always takes place on board when settling down in harbour boats to lower booms to swing out running rigging to make taut we had nothing more to do but look on we said to each other where are we in reality in the united states in some english colony in australia or in new zealand consular residences custom-house offices manufactories a dry dock in which a russian frigate was lying on the heights the large european concession sprinkled with villas and on the quays american bars for the sailors farther off it is true far away behind these commonplace objects in the very depths of the vast green valley peered thousands upon thousands of tiny black houses a tangled mass of curious appearance from which here and there emerged some higher dark red painted roofs probably the true old japanese nagasaki which still exists and in those quarters who knows there may be lurking behind a paper screen some affected cat's-eyed little woman whom perhaps in two or three days having no time to lose i shall marry but no the picture painted by my fancy has faded i can no longer see this little creature in my mind's eye the cellars of the white mice have blurred her image i fear now lest she should be like them at nightfall the decks were suddenly cleared as by enchantment in a second they had shut up their boxes folded their sliding screens and their trick fans and humbly bowing to each of us the little men and little women disappeared slowly as the shades of night closed around us mingling all things in the bluish darkness japan became once more little by little a fairy-like and enchanted country the great mountains now black were mirrored and doubled in the still water at their feet reflecting therein their sharply reversed outlines and presenting the mirage of fearful precipices over which we seemed to hang the stars also were reversed in their order making in the depths of the imaginary abyss a sprinkling of tiny phosphorescent lights then all nagasaki became profusely illuminated sparkling with multitudes of lanterns the smallest suburb the smallest village was lighted up the tiniest but perched up among the trees which in the daytime was invisible threw out its little glow-worm glimmer soon there were innumerable lights all over the country on all the shores of the bay from top to bottom of the mountains myriads of glowing fires shone out in the darkness conveying the impression of a vast capital rising around us in one bewildering amphitheatre beneath in the silent waters another town also illuminated seemed to descend into the depths of the abyss the night was balmy pure delicious the atmosphere laden with the perfume of flowers came wafted to us from the mountains from the tea-houses and other nocturnal resorts the sound of guitars reached our ears seeming in the distance the sweetest of music and the whir of the cicalas 
which in japan is one of the continuous noises of life and which in a few days we shall no longer even be aware of so completely is it the background and foundation of all other terrestrial sounds was sonorous incessant softly monotonous like the murmur of a waterfall chapter three the garden of flowers the next day the rain fell in torrents merciless and unceasing blinding and drenching everything a rain so dense that it was impossible to see through it from one end of the vessel to the other it seemed as if the clouds of the whole world had amassed themselves in nagasaki bay and chosen this great green funnel to stream down and so thickly did the rain fall that it became almost as dark as night through a veil of restless water we still perceived the base of the mountains but the summits were lost to sight among the great dark masses overshadowing us above us shreds of clouds seemingly torn from the dark vault draggled across the trees like grey rags continually melting away in torrents of water the wind howled through the ravines with a deep tone the whole surface of the bay bespattered by the rain flogged by the gusts of wind that blew from all quarters splashed moaned and seethed in violent agitation what depressing weather for a first landing and how was i to find a wife through such a deluge in an unknown country no matter i dressed myself and said to eve who smiled at my obstinate determination in spite of unfavourable circumstances hail me a sampan brother please eve then by a motion of his arm through the wind and rain summoned a kind of little white wooden sarcophagus which was skipping near us on the waves sculled by two yellow boys stark naked in the rain the craft approached us i jumped into it then through a little trapdoor shaped like a rat trap that one of the scullers threw open for me i slipped in and stretched myself at full length on a mat in what is called the cabin of a sampan there was just room enough for my body to lie in this floating coffin which was scrupulously clean white with the whiteness of new deal boards i was well sheltered from the rain that fell pattering on my lid and thus i started for the town lying in this box flat on my stomach rocked by one wave roughly shaken by another at moments almost overturned and through the half-opened door of my rat trap i saw upside down the two little creatures to whom i had entrusted my fate children of eight or ten years of age at the most who with little monkeyish faces had however fully developed muscles like miniature men and were already as skilful as regular old salts suddenly they began to shout no doubt we were approaching the landing place and indeed through my trapdoor which i had now thrown wide open i saw quite near to me the grey flagstones on the quays i got out of my sarcophagus and prepared to set foot on japanese soil for the first time in my life all was streaming around us and the tiresome rain dashed into my eyes hardly had i landed when there bounded toward me a dozen strange beings of what description it was almost impossible to distinguish through the blinding rain a species of human hedgehog each dragging some large black object they came screaming around me and stopped my progress one of them opened and held over my head an enormous closely ribbed umbrella decorated on its transparent surface with paintings of storks and they all smiled at me in an engaging manner with an air of expectation i had been forewarned these were only the djinns who were touting for the honour of my preference nevertheless i was startled at this sudden attack this japanese welcome on a first visit to land the djinns or jin richesans are the runners who drag little carts and are paid for conveying people to and fro being hired by the hour or the distance as cabs are hired in europe their legs were naked to-day they were very wet and their heads were hidden under large shady conical hats by way of waterproofs they wore nothing less than mats of straw with all the ends of the straws turned outward bristling like porcupines they seemed clothed in a thatched roof they continued to smile awaiting my choice not having the honour of being acquainted with any of them in particular i chose at haphazard the gin with the umbrella and got into his little cart of which he carefully lowered the hood he drew an oilcloth apron over my knees pulling it up to my face and then advancing asked me in japanese something which must have meant where to sir to which i replied in the same language to the garden of flowers my friend i said this in the three words i had parrot-like learned by heart astonished that such sounds could mean anything 
astonished too at their being understood we started he running at full speed i dragged along and jerked about in his light chariot wrapped in oilcloth shut up as if in a box both of us unceasingly drenched all the while and dashing all around us the water and mud of the sodden ground to the garden of flowers i had said like a habitual frequenter of the place and quite surprised at hearing myself speak but i was less ignorant about japan than might have been supposed many of my friends on their return home from that country had told me about it and i knew a great deal the garden of flowers is a tea-house an elegant rendezvous there i should inquire for a certain kangaroo san who is at the same time interpreter laundryman and confidential agent for the intercourse of races perhaps this very evening if all went well i should be introduced to the bride destined for me by mysterious fate this thought kept my mind on the alert during the panting journey we made the djinn and i one dragging the other under the merciless downpour oh what a curious japan i saw that day through the gaping of my oilcloth coverings from under the dripping hood of my little cart a sullen muddy half-drowned japan all these houses men and beasts hitherto known to me only in drawings all these that i had beheld painted on blue or pink backgrounds of fans or vases now appeared to me in their hard reality under a dark sky with umbrellas and wooden shoes with tucked up skirts and pitiful aspect at times the rain fell so heavily that i closed up tightly every chink and crevice and the noise and shaking benumbed me so that i completely forgot in what country i was in the hood of the cart were holes through which little streams ran down my back then remembering that i was going for the first time in my life through the very heart of nagasaki i cast an inquiring look outside at the risk of receiving a drenching we were trotting along through a mean narrow little back street there are thousands like it a labyrinth of them the rain falling in cascades from the tops of the roofs on the gleaming flagstones below rendering every everything indistinct and vague through the misty atmosphere at times we passed a woman struggling with her skirts unsteadily tripping along in her high wooden shoes looking exactly like the figures painted on screens cowering under a gaudily daubed paper umbrella again we passed a pagoda where an old granite monster squatting in the water seemed to make a hideous ferocious grimace at me how large this nagasaki is here had we been running hard for the last hour and still it seemed never-ending it is a flat plain and one never would suppose from the view in the offing that so vast a plain lies in the depth of this valley it would however have been impossible for me to say where i was or in what direction we had run i abandoned my fate to my djinn and to my good luck what a steam engine of a man my djinn was i had been accustomed to the chinese runners but they were nothing beside this fellow when i part my oilcloth to peep at anything he is naturally always the first object in my foreground his two naked brown muscular legs scampering along splashing all around and his bristling hedgehog back bending low in the rain do the passers-by gazing at this little dripping cart guess that it contains a suitor in quest of a bride at last my vehicle stops and my djinn with many smiles and precautions lest any fresh rivers should stream down my back lowers the hood of the cart there is a break in the storm and the rain has ceased i had not yet seen his face as an exception to the general rule he is good-looking a young man of about thirty years of age of intelligent and strong appearance and a frank countenance who could have foreseen that a few days later this very djinn but no i will not anticipate and run the risk of throwing beforehand any discredit on chrysanthem we had therefore reached our destination and found ourselves at the foot of a high overhanging mountain probably beyond the limits of the town in some suburban district it apparently became necessary to continue our journey on foot and to climb up an almost perpendicular narrow path around us a number of small country houses garden walls and high bamboo palisades shut off the view the green hill crushed us with its towering height the heavy dark clouds lowering over our heads seemed like a leaden canopy confining us in this unknown spot it really seemed as if the complete absence of perspective inclined one all the better to notice the details of this tiny corner muddy and wet of homely japan now lying before our eyes 
the earth was very red the grasses and wild flowers bordering the pathway were strange to me nevertheless the palings were covered with convolvuli like our own and i recognized china asters zinnias and other familiar flowers in the gardens the atmosphere seemed laden with a curiously complicated odor something besides the perfume of the plants and soil arising no doubt from the human dwelling places a mingled odor i fancied of dried fish and incense not a creature was to be seen of the inhabitants of their homes and life there was not a vestige and i might have imagined myself anywhere in the world my djinn had fastened his little cart under a tree and together we climbed the steep path on the slippery red soil we are going to the garden of flowers are we not i inquired desirous to ascertain whether i had been understood yes yes replied the djinn it is up there and quite near the road turned steep banks hemming it in and darkening it on one side it skirted the mountain all covered with a tangle of wet ferns on the other appeared a large wooden house almost devoid of openings and of evil aspect it was there that my djinn halted what was that sinister looking house the garden of flowers he assured me that it was and seemed very sure of the fact we knocked at a large door which opened immediately slipping back in its groove then two funny little women appeared oldish looking but with evident pretensions to youth exact types of the figures painted on vases with their tiny hands and feet on catching sight of me they threw themselves on all fours their faces touching the floor good gracious what can be the matter i asked myself nothing at all it was only the ceremonious salute to which i am as yet unaccustomed they arose and proceeded to take off my boots one never keeps on one's shoes in a japanese house wiping the bottoms of my trousers and feeling my shoulders to see whether i am wet what always strikes one on first entering a japanese dwelling is the extreme cleanliness the white and chilling bareness of the rooms over the most irreproachable mattings without a crease a line or a stain i was led upstairs to the first story and ushered into a large empty room absolutely empty the paper walls were mounted on sliding panels which fitting into each other can be made to disappear and all one side of the apartment opened like a veranda giving a view of the green country and the grey sky beyond by way of a chair they gave me a square cushion of black velvet and behold me seated low in the middle of this large empty room which by its very vastness is almost chilly the two little women who are the servants of the house and my very humble servants too awaited my orders in attitudes expressive of the profoundest humility it seemed extraordinary that the quaint words the curious phrases i had learned during our exile at the pescadores islands by sheer dint of dictionary and grammar without attaching the least sense to them should mean anything but so it seemed however for i was at once understood i wished in the first place to speak to one monsieur kangourou who is interpreter laundryman and matrimonial agent nothing could be easier they knew him and were willing to go at once in search of him and the elder of the waiting maids made ready for the purpose her wooden clogs and her paper umbrella next i demanded a well-served repast composed of the greatest delicacies of japan better and better they rushed to the kitchen to order it finally i beg they will give tea and rice to my djinn who is waiting for me below i wish in short i wish many things my dear little dolls which i will mention by degrees and with due deliberation when i shall have had time to assemble the necessary words but the more i look at you the more uneasy i feel as to what my fiance of to-morrow may be like almost pretty i grant you you are in virtue of quaintness delicate hands miniature feet but ugly after all and absurdly small you look like little monkeys like little china ornaments like i don't know what i begin to understand that i have arrived at this house at an ill-chosen moment something is going on which does not concern me and i feel that i am in the way from the beginning i might have guessed as much notwithstanding the excessive politeness of my welcome for i remember now that while they were taking off my boots downstairs i heard a murmuring chatter overhead then a noise of panels moved quickly along their grooves evidently to hide from me something not intended for me to see they were improvising for me the apartment in which i now am 
just as in menageries they make a separate compartment for some beasts when the public is admitted now i am left alone while my orders are being executed and i listen attentively squatted like a buddha on my black velvet cushion in the midst of the whiteness of the walls and mats behind the paper partitions feeble voices seemingly numerous are talking in low tones then rises the sound of a guitar and the song of a woman plaintive and gentle in the echoing sonority of the bare house in the melancholy of the rainy weather what one can see through the wide open veranda is very pretty i will admit that it resembles the landscape of a fairy tale there are admirably wooded mountains climbing high into the dark and gloomy sky and hiding in it the peaks of their summits and perched up among the clouds is a temple the atmosphere has that absolute transparency that distance and clearness which follows a great fall of rain but a thick pall still heavy with moisture remains suspended over all and on the foliage of the hanging woods still float great flakes of grey fluff which remain there motionless in the foreground in front of and below this almost fantastic landscape is a miniature garden where two beautiful white cats are taking the air amusing themselves by pursuing each other through the paths of a lilliputian labyrinth shaking the wet sand from their paws the garden is as conventional as possible not a flower but little rocks little lakes dwarf trees cut in grotesque fashion all this is not natural but it is most ingeniously arranged so green so full of fresh mosses in the rain-soaked country below me to the very farthest end of the vast scene reigns a great silence an absolute calm but the woman's voice behind the paper wall continues to sing in a key of gentle sadness and the accompanying guitar has sombre and even gloomy notes stay though now the music is somewhat quicker one might even suppose they were dancing so much the worse i shall try to look between the fragile divisions through a crack which has revealed itself to my notice what a singular spectacle it is evidently the gilded youth of nagasaki holding a great clandestine orgy in an apartment as bare as my own there are a dozen of them seated in a circle on the ground attired in long blue cotton dresses with pagoda sleeves long sleek and greasy hair surmounted by european pot hats and beneath these yellow worn-out bloodless foolish faces on the floor are a number of little spirit lamps little pipes little lacquer trays little teapots little cups all the accessories and all the remains of a japanese feast resembling nothing so much as a doll's tea party in the midst of this circle of dandies are three overdressed women one might say three weird visions robed in garments of pale and indefinable colours embroidered with golden monsters their great coiffures are arranged with fantastic art stuck full of pins and flowers two are seated with their backs turned to me one is holding the guitar the other singing with that soft pretty voice thus seen furtively from behind their pose their hair the nape of their necks all is exquisite and i tremble lest a movement should reveal to me faces which might destroy the enchantment the third girl is on her feet dancing before this areopagus of idiots with their lanky locks and pot hats what a shock when she turns round she wears over her face the horribly grinning death-like mask of a spectre or a vampire the mask unfastened falls and behold a darling little fairy of about twelve or fifteen years of age slim and already a coquette already a woman dressed in a long robe of shaded dark blue china crepe covered with embroidery resembling bats grey bats black bats golden bats suddenly there are steps on the stairs the light footsteps of barefooted women pattering over the white mats no doubt the first course of my luncheon is just about to be served i fall back quickly fixed and motionless upon my black velvet cushion there are three of them now three waiting maids who arrive in single file with smiles and curtsies one offers me the spirit lamp and the teapot another preserved fruits in delightful little plates the third absolutely indefinable objects upon gems of little trays and they grovel before me on the floor placing all this plaything of a meal at my feet at this moment my impressions of japan are charming enough 
i feel myself fairly launched upon this tiny artificial fictitious world which i felt i knew already from the paintings on lacquer and porcelains it is so exact a representation the three little squatting women graceful and dainty with their narrow slits of eyes their magnificent coiffures in huge bows smooth and shining as shoe polish and the little tea service on the floor the landscape seen through the veranda the pagoda perched among the clouds and over all the same affectation everywhere in every detail even the woman's melancholy voice still to be heard behind the paper partition was evidently the proper way for them to sing these musicians i had so often seen painted in amazing colours on rice paper half closing their dreamy eyes among impossibly large flowers long before i arrived there i had perfectly pictured japan to myself nevertheless in the reality it almost seems to be smaller more finicking than i had imagined it and also much more mournful no doubt by reason of that great pall of black clouds hanging over us and this incessant rain while awaiting monsieur kangourou who is dressing himself it appears and will be here shortly it may be as well to begin luncheon in the daintiest bowl imaginable adorned with flights of stalks is the most wildly impossible soup made of seaweed after which there are little fish dried in sugar crabs in sugar beans in sugar and fruits in vinegar and pepper all this is atrocious but above all unexpected and unimaginable the little women make me eat laughing much with that perpetual irritating laugh which is peculiar to japan they make me eat according to their fashion with dainty chopsticks fingered with affected grace i am becoming accustomed to their faces the whole effect is refined a refinement so entirely different from our own that at first sight i understand nothing of it although in the long run it may end by pleasing me suddenly enters like a night butterfly awakened in broad daylight like a rare and surprising moth the dancing girl from the other compartment the child who wore the horrible mask no doubt she wishes to have a look at me she rolls her eyes like a timid kitten and then all at once tamed nestles against me with a coaxing air of childishness which is a delightfully transparent assumption she is slim elegant delicate and smells sweet she is drolly painted white as plaster with a little circle of rouge marked very precisely in the middle of each cheek the mouth reddened and a touch of gilding outlining the underlip as they could not whiten the back of her neck on account of all the delicate little curls of hair growing there they had in their love of exactitude stopped the white plaster in a straight line which might have been cut with a knife and in consequence at the nape appears a square of natural skin of a deep yellow an imperious note sounds on the guitar evidently a summons crack away she goes the little fairy to entertain the driveling fools on the other side of the screens suppose i marry this one without seeking any further i should respect her as a child committed to my care i should take her for what she is a fantastic and charming plaything what an amusing little household i should set up really short of marrying a china ornament i should find it difficult to choose better at this moment enters monsieur kangourou clad in a suit of grey tweed which might have come from la belle jardiniere or the pont neuf with a pot hat and white thread gloves his countenance is at once foolish and cunning he has hardly any nose or eyes he makes a real japanese salutation an abrupt dip the hands placed flat on the knees the body making a right angle to the legs as if the fellow were breaking in two a little snake-like hissing produced by sucking the saliva between the teeth which is the highest expression of obsequious politeness in this country you speak french monsieur kangourou yes monsieur renewed bows he makes one for each word i utter as if he were a mechanical toy pulled by a string when he is seated before me on the ground he limits himself to a duck of the head always accompanied by the same hissing noise of the saliva a cup of tea monsieur kangourou fresh salute and an extra affected gesticulation with the hands as if to say i should hardly dare it is too great a condescension on your part however anything to oblige you he guesses at the first words what i require from him of course he replies we shall see about it at once in a week's time as it happens a family from simonoseki in which there are two charming daughters 
will be here what in a week you don't know me monsieur kangourou no no either now tomorrow or not at all again a hissing bow and kangourou san understanding my agitation begins to pass in feverish review all the young persons at his disposal in nagasaki let us see there was mademoiselle Oye. what a pity that you did not speak a few days sooner so pretty so clever at playing the guitar it is an irreparable misfortune she was engaged only yesterday by a russian officer ah mademoiselle abricot would she suit you mademoiselle abricot she is the daughter of a wealthy china merchant in the decima bazaar a person of the highest merit but she would be very dear her parents who think a great deal of her will not let her go under a hundred yen a yen is equal to four shillings a month she is very accomplished thoroughly understands commercial writing and has at her fingers ends more than two thousand characters of learned writing in a poetical competition she gained the first prize with a sonnet composed in praise of the blossoms of the blackthorn hedges seen in the dew of early morning only she is not very pretty one of her eyes is smaller than the other and she has a hole in her cheek resulting from an illness of her childhood oh no on no account that one let us seek among a less distinguished class of young persons but without scars and how about those on the other side of the screen in those fine gold embroidered dresses for instance the dancer with the spectre mask monsieur kangourou or again she who sings in so dulcet a strain and has such a charming nape to her neck he does not at first understand my drift then when he gathers my meaning he shakes his head almost in a joking way and says no monsieur no those are only geishas geishas are professional dancers and singers trained at the yedo conservatory monsieur geishas well but why not a geisha what difference can it make to me whether they are geishas or not later no doubt when i understand japanese affairs better i shall appreciate myself the enormity of my proposal one would really suppose i had talked of marrying the devil at this point m kangourou suddenly calls to mind one mademoiselle jasmin heavens how was it he had not thought of her at once she is absolutely and exactly what i want he will go to-morrow or this very evening to make the necessary overtures to the parents of this young person who live a long way off on the opposite hill in the suburb of diu genji she is a very pretty girl of about fifteen she can probably be engaged for about eighteen or twenty dollars a month on condition of presenting her with a few costumes of the best fashion and of lodging her in a pleasant and well-situated house all of which a man of gallantry like myself could not fail to do well let us fix upon mademoiselle jasmin then and now we must part time presses Monsieur kangourou will come on board to-morrow to communicate to me the result of his first proceedings and to arrange with me for the interview for the present he refuses to accept any remuneration but i am to give him my washing and to procure him the custom of my brother officers of the triomphante it is all settled profound bows they put on my boots again at the door my djinn profiting by the interpreter kind fortune has placed in his way begs to be recommended to me for future custom his stand is on the quay his number is four hundred and fifteen inscribed in french characters on the lantern of his vehicle we have a number four hundred and fifteen on board one le Gueulec, gunner who serves the left of one of my guns happy thought i shall remember this his price is sixpence the journey or five pence an hour for his customers capital he shall have my custom that is promised and now let us be off the waiting maids who have escorted me to the door fall on all fours as a final salute and remain prostrate on the threshold as long as i am still in sight down the dark pathway where the rain trickles off the great overarching bracken upon my head end of section one section two of madame chrysanthème by pierre loti this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter four choosing a bride three days have passed night is closing in an apartment which has been mine since yesterday 
eve and i on the first floor move restlessly over the white mats striding to and fro in the great bare room of which the thin dry flooring cracks beneath our footsteps we are both rather irritated by prolonged expectation eve whose impatience shows itself more freely from time to time looks out of the window as for myself a chill suddenly seizes me at the idea that i have chosen to inhabit this lonely house lost in the midst of the suburb of a totally strange town perched high on the mountain and almost opening upon the woods what wild notion could have taken possession of me to settle myself in surroundings so foreign and unknown breathing of isolation and sadness the waiting unnerves me and i beguile the time by examining all the little details of the building the woodwork of the ceiling is complicated and ingenious on the partitions of white paper which form the walls are scattered tiny microscopic blue feathered tortoises they are late said eve who is still looking out into the street as to being late that they certainly are by a good hour already and night is falling and the boat which should take us back to dine on board will be gone probably we shall have to sup japanese fashion to-night heaven only knows where the people of this country have no sense of punctuality or of the value of time therefore i continue to inspect the minute and comical details of my dwelling here instead of handles such as we should have made to pull these movable partitions they have made little oval holes just the shape of a finger end into which one is evidently to put one's thumb these little holes have a bronze ornamentation and on looking closely one sees that the bronze is curiously chased here is the lady fanning herself there in the next hole is represented a branch of cherry in full blossom what eccentricity there is in the taste of these people to bestow assiduous labour on such miniature work and then to hide it at the bottom of a hole to put one's finger in looking like a mere spot in the middle of a great white panel to accumulate so much patient and delicate workmanship on almost imperceptible accessories and all to produce an effect which is absolutely nil an effect of the most complete bareness and nudity eve still continues to gaze forth like sister anne from the side on which he leans my veranda overlooks a street or rather a road bordered with houses which climbs higher and higher and loses itself almost immediately in the verdure of the mountain in the fields of tea the underwood and the cemeteries as for myself this delay finally irritates me thoroughly and i turn my glances to the opposite side the other end of my house also a veranda opens first of all upon a garden then upon a marvellous panorama of woods and mountains with all the venerable japanese quarters of nagasaki lying confusedly like a black ant heap six hundred feet below us this evening in a dull twilight notwithstanding that it is a twilight of july these things are melancholy great clouds heavy with rain and showers ready to fall are travelling across the sky no i cannot feel at home in this strange dwelling i have chosen i feel sensations of extreme solitude and strangeness the mere prospect of passing the night in it gives me a shudder of horror ah at last brother said eve i believe yes i really believe she is coming at last i look over his shoulder and i see a back view of a little doll the finishing touches to whose toilette are being put in the solitary street a last maternal glance is given the enormous bows of the sash the folds at the waist her dress is of pearl-grey silk her obi sash of mauve satin a sprig of silver flowers trembles in her black hair a parting ray of sunlight touches the little figure five or six persons accompany her yes it is undoubtedly mademoiselle jasmin they are bringing me my fiancée i rush to the ground floor inhabited by old madame prune my landlady and her aged husband they are absorbed in prayer before the altar of their ancestors here they are madame prune i cry in japanese here they are bring at once the tea the lamp the embers the little pipes for the ladies the little bamboo pots bring up as quickly as possible all the accessories for my reception i hear the front door open and hasten upstairs again the wooden clogs are deposited on the floor the staircase creaks gently under little bare feet eve and i look at each other with a longing to laugh an old lady enters two old ladies three old ladies emerging from the doorway one after another with jerking and mechanical salutations 
which we return as best we can fully conscious of our inferiority in this particular style then come persons of intermediate age then quite young ones a dozen at least friends neighbors the whole quarter in fact and the entire company on arriving becomes confusedly engaged in reciprocal salutations i salute you you salute me i salute you again and you return it and i re-salute you again and i express that i shall never never be able to return it according to your high merit and i bang my forehead against the ground and you stick your nose between the planks of the flooring and there they are on all fours one before another it is a polite dispute all eager to yield precedence as to sitting down or passing first and compliments without end are murmured in low tones with faces against the floor they seat themselves at last smiling in a ceremonious circle we two remain standing our eyes fixed on the staircase and at length emerges the little aigrette of silver flowers the ebony coiffure the grey silk robe and mauve sash of mademoiselle jasmin my fiancée heavens why i know her already long before setting foot in japan i had met her on every fan on every teacup with her silly air her puffy little face her tiny eyes mere gimlet holes above those expanses of impossible pink and white cheeks she is young that is all i can say in her favour she is even so young that i should almost scruple to accept her the wish to laugh leaves me suddenly and instead a profound chill seizes my heart what share even an hour of my life with that little doll never the next question is how to get rid of her she advances smiling with an air of repressed triumph and behind her looms monsieur kangourou in his suit of grey tweed fresh salutes and behold her on all fours she too before my landlady and before my neighbours eve the big eve who is not about to be married stands behind me with a comical grimace hardly repressing his laughter while to give myself time to collect my ideas i offer tea in little cups little spittoons and embers to the company nevertheless my discomforted air does not escape my visitors monsieur kangourou anxiously inquires how do you like her and i reply in a low voice but with great resolution not at all i won't have that one never i believe that this remark was almost understood in the circle around me consternation was depicted on every face jaws dropped and pipes went out and now i address my reproaches to kangourou why have you brought her to me in such pomp before friends and neighbours of both sexes instead of showing her to me discreetly as if by chance as i had wished what an affront you will compel me now to put upon all these polite persons the old ladies the mamma no doubt and aunts prick up their ears and monsieur kangourou translates to them softening as much as possible my heart-rending decision i feel really almost sorry for them the fact is that for women who not to put too fine a point upon it have come to sell a child they have an air i was not prepared for i can hardly say an air of respectability a word in use with us which is absolutely without meaning in japan but an air of unconscious and good-natured simplicity they are only doing a thing that is perfectly admissible in their world and really it all resembles more than i could have thought possible a bona fide marriage but what fault do you find with the little girl asks monsieur kangourou in consternation i endeavour to present the matter in the most flattering light she is very young i say and then she is too white too much like our own women i wished for one with an ivory skin just as a change but that is only the paint they have put on her monsieur beneath it i assure you she is of an ivory hue eve leans toward me and whispers look over there brother in that corner by the last panel have you noticed the one who is sitting down not i in my annoyance i had not observed her she had her back to the light was dressed in dark colours and sat in the careless attitude of one who keeps in the background the fact is this one pleased me much better eyes with long lashes rather narrow but which would have been called good in any country in the world with almost an expression almost a thought a coppery tint on her rounded cheeks a straight nose slightly thick lips but well modelled and with pretty corners 
a little older than mademoiselle jasmin about eighteen years of age perhaps already more of a woman she wore an expression of ennui also of a little contempt as if she regretted her attendance at a spectacle which dragged so much and was so little amusing monsieur kangourou who is that young lady over there in dark blue over there monsieur she is called mademoiselle chrysanthème she came with the others you see here she is only here as a spectator she pleases you said he with eager suddenness espying a way out of his difficulty then forgetting all his politeness all his ceremoniousness all his japaneserie he takes her by the hand forces her to rise to stand in the dying daylight to let herself be seen and she who has followed our eyes and begins to guess what is on foot lowers her head in confusion with a more decided but more charming part and tries to step back half sulky half smiling it makes no difference continues monsieur Kangourou it can be arranged just as well with this one she is not married either monsieur she is not married then why didn't the idiot propose her to me at once instead of the other for whom i have a feeling of the greatest pity poor little soul with her pearl-grey dress her sprig of flowers her now sad and mortified expression and her eyes which twinkle like those of a child about to cry it can be arranged monsieur repeats kangourou again who at this moment appears to me a go-between of the lowest type a rascal of the meanest kind only he adds we eve and i are in the way during the negotiations and while mademoiselle chrysanthème remains with her eyelids lowered as befits the occasion while the various families on whose countenances may be read every degree of astonishment every phase of expectation remain seated in a circle on my white mats he sends us two into the veranda and we gaze down into the depths below us upon a misty and vague nagasaki a nagasaki melting into a blue haze of darkness then ensue long discourses in japanese arguments without end monsieur kangourou who is laundryman and low scamp in french only has returned for these discussions to the long formulas of his country from time to time i express impatience i ask this worthy creature who i am less and less able to consider in a serious light come now tell us frankly kangourou are we any nearer coming to some arrangement is all this ever going to end in a moment monsieur in a moment and he resumes his air of political economist seriously debating social problems well one must submit to the slowness of this people and while the darkness falls like a veil over the japanese town i have leisure to reflect with as much melancholy as i please upon the bargain that is being concluded behind me night has closed in it has been necessary to light the lamps it is ten o'clock when all is finally settled and monsieur kangourou comes to tell me all is arranged monsieur her parents will give her up for twenty dollars a month the same price as mademoiselle jasmin on hearing this i am possessed suddenly with extreme vexation that i should have made up my mind so quickly to link myself in ever so fleeting and transient a manner with this little creature and dwell with her in this isolated house we return to the room she is the centre of the circle and seated and they have placed the aigrette of flowers in her hair there is actually some expression in her glance and i am almost persuaded that she this one thinks eve is astonished at her modest attitude at her little timid airs of a young girl on the verge of matrimony he had imagined nothing like it in such a connection as this nor i either i must confess she is really very pretty brother said he very pretty take my word for it these good folks their customs this scene strike him dumb with astonishment he cannot get over it and remains in a maze oh this is too much he says and the idea of writing a long letter to his wife at toulvin describing it all diverts him greatly chrysanthème and i join hands eve too advances and touches the dainty little paw after all if i wed her it is chiefly his fault i never should have remarked her without his observation that she was pretty who can tell how this strange arrangement will turn out is it a woman or a doll well time will show the families having lighted their many-coloured lanterns swinging at the ends of slight sticks prepare to retire with many compliments bows and curtsies 
when it is a question of descending the stairs no one is willing to go first and at a given moment the whole party are again on all fours motionless and murmuring polite phrases in undertones all back there said eve laughing and employing a nautical term used when there is a stoppage of any kind at length they all melt away descending the stairs with a last buzzing accompaniment of civilities and polite phrases finished from one step to another in voices which gradually die away he and i remain alone in the unfriendly empty apartment where the mats are still littered with little cups of tea the absurd little pipes and the miniature trays let us watch them go away said eve leaning out at the door of the garden is a renewal of the same salutations and curtsies, and then the two groups of women separate. Their bedaubed paper lanterns fade away trembling in the distance, balanced at the extremity of flexible canes which they hold in their fingertips, as one would hold a fishing rod in the dark to catch night birds. The procession of the unfortunate Mademoiselle Jasmin mounts upward toward the mountain, while that of Mademoiselle Chrysantheme winds downward by a narrow old street, half stairway, half goat path which leads to the town then we also depart the night is fresh silent exquisite the eternal song of the cicalas fills the air we can still see the red lanterns of my new family dwindling away in the distance as they descend and gradually become lost in that yawning abyss at the bottom of which lies nagasaki our way too lies downward but on an opposite slope by steep paths leading to the sea and when i find myself once more on board when the scene enacted on the hill above recurs to my mind it seems to me that my betrothal is a joke and my new family a set of puppets chapter five a fantastic marriage july tenth eighteen eighty five three days have passed since my marriage was an accomplished fact in the lower part of the town in one of the new cosmopolitan districts in an ugly pretentious building which is a sort of registry office the deed was signed and countersigned with marvellous hieroglyphics in a large book in the presence of those absurd little creatures formerly silken-robed samurai but now called policemen dressed up in tight jackets and russian caps the ceremony took place in the full heat of midday chrysantheme and her mother arrived together and i alone we seemed to have met for the purpose of ratifying some discreditable contract and the two women trembled in the presence of these ugly little men who in their eyes were the personification of the law in the middle of their official scrawl they made me write in french my name christian name and profession then they gave me an extraordinary document on a sheet of rice paper which set forth the permission granted me by the civilian authorities of the island of Kyushu to inhabit a house situated in the suburb of Diu Genji, with a person called Chrysantheme, the said permission being under the protection of the police during the whole of my stay in Japan. In the evening, however, in our own quarter, our little marriage became a very pretty affair, a procession carrying lanterns, a festive tea and some music. All this seemed quite necessary now we are almost an old married couple and we are gently settling down into everyday habits chrysantheme tends the flowers in our bronze vases dresses herself with studied care proud of her socks with the divided big toe and strums all day on a kind of long-necked guitar producing sweet and plaintive sounds chapter six my new menage in our home everything looks like a japanese picture we have folding screens little odd-shaped stools bearing vases full of flowers and at the farther end of the apartment in a nook forming a kind of altar a large gilded buddha sits enthroned in a lotus the house is just as i had fancied it should be in the many dreams of japan i had had before my arrival during the long night watches perched on high in a peaceful suburb in the midst of green gardens made up of paper panels and taken to pieces according to one's fancy like a child's toy whole families of cicalas chirp day and night under our old resounding roof from our veranda we have a bewildering bird's-eye view of nagasaki of its streets its junks and its great pagodas which at certain hours is illuminated at our feet like some scene in fairyland chapter seven the ladies of the fans 
regarded as a mere outline little chrysanthème has been seen everywhere and by everybody whoever has looked at one of those paintings on china or silk that are sold in our bazaars knows perfectly the pretty stiff headdress the leaning figure ever ready to try some new gracious salutation the sash fastened behind in an enormous bow the large flowing sleeves the drapery slightly clinging about the ankles with a little crooked train like a lizard's tail but her face no not every one has seen that there is something special about it moreover the type of women the japanese paint mostly on their vases is an exceptional one in their country it is almost exclusively among the nobility that these personages are found with their long pale faces painted in tender rose tints and silly long necks which give them the appearance of storks this distinguished type which i am obliged to admit was also mademoiselle jasmin's is rare particularly at nagasaki among the middle classes and the common people the ugliness is more pleasant and sometimes becomes a kind of prettiness the eyes are still too small and hardly able to open but the faces are rounder browner more vivacious and in the women remains a certain vagueness of feature something childlike which prevails to the very end of their lives they are so laughing and so merry all these little nipponese dolls rather a forced mirth it is true studied and at times with a false ring nevertheless one is attracted by it chrysanthème is an exception for she is melancholy what thoughts are running through that little brain my knowledge of her language is still too limited to enable me to find out moreover it is a hundred to one that she has no thoughts whatever and even if she had what do i care i have chosen her to amuse me and i should really prefer that she should have one of those insignificant little thoughtless faces like all the others chapter eight the necessary veil when night comes on we light two hanging lamps of religious symbolism which burn till daylight before our gilded idol we sleep on the floor on a thin cotton mattress which is unfolded and laid out over our white matting chrysanthème's pillow is a little wooden block cut so as to fit exactly the nape of her neck without disturbing the elaborate headdress which must never be taken down the pretty black hair i shall probably never see undone my pillow a chinese model is a kind of little square drum covered over with serpent skin we sleep under a gauze mosquito net of sombre greenish blue dark as the shades of night stretched out on an orange colored ribbon these are the traditional colors and all respectable families of nagasaki possess a similar net it envelopes us like a tent the mosquitoes and the night moths whirl around it this sounds very pretty and written down looks very well in reality however it is not so something i know not what is lacking and everything is very paltry in other lands in the delightful isles of oceania in the old lifeless quarters of stamboul it seemed as if mere words could never express all i felt and i struggled vainly against my own inability to render in human language the penetrating charm surrounding me here on the contrary words exact and truthful in themselves seem always too thrilling too great for the subject seem to embellish it unduly i feel as if i were acting for my own benefit some wretchedly trivial and third-rate comedy and whenever i try to consider my home in a serious spirit the scoffing figure of monsieur kangourou rises before me the matrimonial agent to whom i am indebted for my happiness chapter nine my plaything july twelfth eve visits us whenever he is free in the evening at five o'clock after his duties on board are fulfilled he is our only european visitor and with the exception of a few civilities and cups of tea exchanged with our neighbors we lead a very retired life only in the evenings winding our way through the steep narrow streets and carrying our lanterns at the end of short sticks we go down to nagasaki in search of amusement at the theatres at the tea-houses or in the bazaars eve treats my wife as if she were a plaything and continually assures me that she is charming i find her as exasperating as the cicalas on my roof and when i am alone at home side by side with this little creature twanging the strings of her long-necked guitar facing this marvellous panorama of pagodas and mountains 
i am overcome by sadness almost to tears chapter ten nocturnal terrors july thirteenth last night as we reposed under the japanese roof of Diu Genji, the thin old wooden roof scorched by a hundred years of sunshine vibrating at the least sound like the stretched out parchment of a tom-tom in the silence which prevails at two o'clock in the morning we heard overhead a sound like a regular wild huntsman's chase passing at full gallop nizumi the mice said chrysanthème suddenly the word brings back to my mind yet another phrase spoken in a very different language in a country far away from here sechan a word heard elsewhere a word that has likewise been whispered in my ear by a woman's voice under similar circumstances in a moment of nocturnal terror sechan it was during one of our first nights at stambul spent under the mysterious roof of ayub when danger surrounded us on all sides a noise on the steps of the black staircase had made us tremble and she also my dear little turkish companion had said to me in her beloved language sechan the mice at that fond recollection a thrill of sweet memories coursed through my veins it was as if i had been startled out of a long ten years sleep i looked down upon the doll beside me with a sort of hatred wondering why i was there and i arose with almost a feeling of remorse to escape from that blue gauze net i stepped out upon the veranda and there i paused gazing into the depths of the starlit night beneath me nagasaki lay asleep wrapped in a soft light slumber hushed by the murmuring sound of a thousand insects in the moonlight and fairy-like with its roseate hues then turning my head i saw behind me the gilded idol with our lamps burning in front of it the idol smiling the impassive smile of buddha and its presence seemed to cast around it something i know not what strange and incomprehensible never until now had i slept under the eye of such a god in the midst of the calm and silence of the night i strove to recall my poignant impressions of stambul but alas i strove in vain they would not return to me in this strange far-off world through the transparent blue gauze appeared my little japanese as she lay in her sombre nightrobe with all the fantastic grace of her country the nape of her neck resting on its wooden block and her hair arranged in large shiny bows her amber-tinted arms pretty and delicate emerged bare up to the shoulders from her wide sleeves what can those mice on the roof have done to him thought chrysanthème of course she could not understand in a coaxing manner like a playful kitten she glanced at me with her half-closed eyes inquiring why i did not come back to sleep and i returned to my place by her side chapter eleven a game of archery july fourteenth this is the national fete day of france in nagasaki harbour all the ships are adorned with flags and salutes are fired in our honour alas all day long i cannot help thinking of that last fourteenth of july spent in the deep calm and quiet of my old home the door shut against all intruders while the gay crowd roared outside there i had remained till evening seated on a bench shaded by an arbour covered with honeysuckle where in the bygone days of my childhood's summers i used to settle myself with my copy-books and pretend to learn my lessons oh those days when i was supposed to learn my lessons how my thoughts used to rove what voyages what distant lands what tropical forests did i not behold in my dreams at that time near the garden bench in some of the crevices in the stone wall dwelt many a big ugly black spider always on the alert peeping out of his nook ready to pounce upon any giddy fly or wandering centipede one of my amusements consisted in tickling the spiders gently very gently with a blade of grass or a cherry stalk in their webs mystified they would rush out fancying they had to deal with some sort of prey while i would rapidly draw back my hand in disgust well last year on that fourteenth of july as i recalled my days of latin themes and translations now forever flown and this game of boyish days i actually recognized the very same spiders or at least their daughters lying in wait in the very same places gazing at them and at the tufts of grass and moss around me a thousand memories of those summers of my early life welled up within me memories which for years past had lain slumbering under this old wall sheltered by the ivy boughs 
while all that is ourselves perpetually changes and passes away the constancy with which nature repeats always in the same manner her most infinitesimal details seems a wonderful mystery the same peculiar species of moss grows afresh for centuries on precisely the same spot and the same little insects each summer do the same thing in the same place i must admit that this episode of my childhood and the spiders have little to do with the story of chrysanthème but an incongruous interruption is quite in keeping with the taste of this country everywhere it is practised in conversation in music even in painting a landscape painter for instance when he has finished a picture of mountains and crags will not hesitate to draw in the very middle of the sky a circle or a lozenge or some kind of framework within which he will represent anything incoherent and inappropriate a bonze fanning himself or a lady taking a cup of tea nothing is more thoroughly japanese than such digressions made without the slightest apropos moreover if i roused my past memories it was the better to force myself to notice the difference between that day of july last year so peacefully spent amid surroundings familiar to me from my earliest infancy and my present animated life passed in the midst of such a novel world to-day therefore under the scorching midday sun at two o'clock three swift-footed gins dragged us at full speed eve chrysanthem and myself in indian file each in a little jolting cart to the farther end of nagasaki and there deposited us at the foot of some gigantic steps that run straight up the mountain these are the granite steps leading to the great temple of osueva wide enough to give access to a whole regiment they are as grand and imposing as any work of babylon or nineveh and in complete contrast with all the finical surroundings we climb up and up chrysanthème listlessly affecting fatigue under her paper parasol painted with pink butterflies on a black ground as we ascended we passed under enormous monastic porticos also in granite of rude and primitive style in truth these steps and these temple porticos are the only imposing works that this people has created and they astonish for they do not seem japanese we climb still higher at this sultry hour of the day from top to bottom of the enormous grey steps only we three are to be seen on all that granite there are but the pink butterflies on chrysanthème's parasol to give a cheerful and brilliant touch we passed through the first temple yard in which are two white china turrets bronze lanterns and the statue of a large horse in jade then without pausing at the sanctuary we turned to the left and entered a shady garden which formed a terrace halfway up the hill at the extremity of which was situated the don Chaya, in english the tea-house of the toads this was the place where chrysanthem had wished to take us we sat down at a table under a black linen tent decorated with large white letters of funereal aspect and two laughing musmes hastened to wait upon us the word musme means a young girl or a very young woman it is one of the prettiest words in the nipponese language it seems almost as if there were a little pout in the very sound a pretty taking little pout such as they put on and also as if a little pert physiognomy were described by it i shall often make use of it knowing none other in our own language that conveys the same meaning some japanese watteau must have mapped out this donko chaya for it has rather an affected air of rurality though very pretty it is well shaded under a shelter of large trees with dense foliage and a miniature lake close by the chosen residence of a few toads has given it its attractive denomination lucky toads who crawl and croak on the finest of moss in the midst of tiny artificial islets decked with gardenias in full bloom from time to time one of them informs us of his thoughts by a quack uttered in a deep bass croak infinitely more hollow than that of our own toads under the tent of this tea-house we sit on a sort of balcony jutting out from the mountainside overhanging from on high the greyish town and its suburbs buried in greenery around above and beneath us cling and hang on every possible point clumps of trees and fresh green woods with the delicate and varying foliage of the temperate zone we can see at our feet the deep roadstead foreshortened and slanting diminished in appearance till it looks like a sombre rent in the mass of large green mountains and farther still quite low on the black and stagnant waters are the men of war the steamboats and the junks with flags flying from every mast 
against the dark green which is the dominant shade everywhere stand out these thousand scraps of bunting emblems of the different nationalities all displayed all flying in honour of far distant france the colours most prevailing in this motley assemblage are the white flag with a red ball emblem of the empire of the rising sun where we now are with the exception of three or four mousmes at the farther end who are practising with bows and arrows we are to-day the only people in the garden and the mountain round about is silent having finished her cigarette and her cup of tea chrysanthem also wishes to exert her skill for archery is still held in honour among the young women the old man who keeps the range picks out for her his best arrows tipped with white and red feathers and she takes aim with a serious air the mark is a circle traced in the middle of a picture on which is painted in flat grey tones terrifying chimera flying through the clouds chrysanthème is certainly an adroit markswoman and we admire her as much as she expected then eve who is usually clever at all games of skill wishes to try his luck and fails it is amusing to see her with her mincing ways and smiles arrange with the tips of her little fingers the sailor's broad hands placing them on the bow and the string in order to teach him the proper manner never have they seemed to get on so well together eve and my doll that i might even feel anxious were i less sure of my good brother and if moreover it was not a matter of perfect indifference to me in the stillness of the garden amid the balmy peacefulness of these mountains a loud noise suddenly startles us a unique powerful terrible sound which is prolonged in infinite metallic vibrations it begins again sounding more appalling boom borne to us by the rising wind nippon kane exclaims chrysanthem and she again takes up her brightly feathered arrows nippon kane the japanese brass it is the japanese brass that is sounding it is the monstrous gong of a monastery situated in a suburb beneath us it is powerful indeed the japanese brass when the strokes are ended when it is no longer heard a vibration seems to linger among the suspended foliage and a prolonged quiver runs through the air i am obliged to admit that chrysanthème looks very charming shooting her arrows her figure well bent back the better to bend her bow her loose hanging sleeves caught up to her shoulders showing the graceful bare arms polished like amber and very much the same colour each arrow whistles by with the rustle of a bird's wing then a short sharp little blow is heard the target is hit always at nightfall when chrysanthème has gone up to Diu genji we cross eve and i the european concession on our way to the ship to take up our watch till the following day the cosmopolitan quarter exhaling an odour of absinthe is dressed up with flags and squibs are being fired off in honour of france long lines of gins pass by dragging as fast as their naked legs can carry them the crew of the triomphante who are shouting and fanning themselves the marseillaise is heard everywhere english sailors are singing it gutturally with a dull and low cadence like their own god save in all the american bars grinding organs are hammering it with many an odious variation and flourish in order to attract our men one amusing recollection comes back to me of that evening on our return we had by mistake turned into a street inhabited by a multitude of ladies of doubtful reputation i can still see that big fellow eve struggling with a whole band of tiny little mousmes of twelve or fifteen years of age who barely reached up to his waist and were pulling him by the sleeves eager to lead him astray astonished and indignant he repeated as he extricated himself from their clutches oh this is too much so shocked was he at seeing such mere babies so young so tiny already so brazen and shameless end of book one end of section two Section three of Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Loti. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two. Chapter twelve. Happy families. July eighteenth. By this time, four officers of my ship are married like myself and inhabiting the slopes of the same suburb. 
this arrangement is quite an ordinary occurrence and is brought about without difficulties mystery or danger through the officers of the same monsieur kangourou as a matter of course we are on visiting terms with all these ladies first there is our very merry neighbour madame Campanule, who is little charles n's wife then madame jeanquille who is even merrier than Campanule, like a young bird and the daintiest fairy of them all she has married x a fair northerner who adores her they are a lover-like and inseparable pair the only one that will probably weep when the hour of parting comes then siku san with dr y and lastly the midshipman z with the tiny madame tuki san no taller than a boot thirteen years old at the outside and already a regular woman full of her own importance a petulant little gossip in my childhood i was sometimes taken to the learned animals theatre and i remember a certain madame de pompadour a principal role filled by a gaily dressed old monkey tuki san reminds me of her in the evening all these folk usually come and fetch us for a long processional walk with lighted lanterns my wife more serious more melancholy perhaps even more refined and belonging i fancy to a higher class tries when these friends come to us to play the part of the lady of the house it is comical to see the entry of these ill-matched pairs partners for a day the ladies with their disjointed bows falling on all fours before chrysanthème the queen of the establishment when we are all assembled we set out arm in arm one behind another and always carrying at the end of our short sticks little white or red paper lanterns it is a pretty custom we are obliged to scramble down the kind of street or rather goat's path which leads to the japanese nagasaki with the prospect alas of having to climb up again at night clamber up all the steps all the slippery slopes stumble over all the stones before we shall be able to get home go to bed and sleep we make our descent in the darkness under the branches under the foliage among dark gardens and venerable little houses that throw but a faint glimmer on the road and when the moon is absent or clouded over our lanterns are by no means unnecessary when at last we reach the bottom suddenly without transition we find ourselves in the very heart of nagasaki and its busy throng in a long illuminated street where vociferating gins hurry along and thousands of paper lanterns swing and gleam in the wind it is life and animation after the peace of our silent suburb here decorum requires that we should separate from our wives all five take hold of each other's hands like a batch of little girls out walking we follow them with an air of indifference seen from behind our dolls are really very dainty with their back hair so tidily arranged their tortoiseshell pins so coquettishly placed they shuffle along their high wooden clogs making an ugly sound striving to walk with their toes turned in according to the height of fashion and elegance at every minute they burst out laughing yes seen from behind they are very pretty they have like all japanese women the most lovely turn of the head moreover they are very funny thus drawn up in line in speaking of them we say our little trained dogs and in truth they are singularly like them this great nagasaki is the same from one end to another with its numberless petroleum lamps burning its many-coloured lanterns flickering and innumerable panting gins always the same narrow streets lined on each side with the same low houses built of paper and wood always the same shops without glass windows open to all the winds equally rudimentary whatever may be sold or made in them whether they display the finest gold lacquer ware the most marvellous china jars or old worn-out pots and pans dried fish and ragged frippery all the salesmen are seated on the ground in the midst of their valuable or trumpery merchandise their legs bared nearly to the waist and all kinds of queer little trades are carried on under the public gaze by strangely primitive means by workmen of the most ingenious type oh what wonderful goods are exposed for sale in those streets what whimsical extravagance in those bazaars no horses no carriages are ever seen in the town nothing but people on foot or the comical little carts dragged along by the runners some few europeans straggling hither and thither wanderers from the ships in harbour 
some japanese fortunately as yet but few dressed up in coats other natives who content themselves with adding to their national costume the pot hat from which their long sleek locks hang down and all around eager haggling bargaining and laughter in the bazaars every evening our musmes make endless purchases like spoiled children they buy everything they fancy toys pins ribbons flowers and then they prettily offer one another presents with childish little smiles for instance Compagnul buys for chrysanthem an ingeniously contrived lantern on which set in motion by some invisible machinery chinese shadows dance in a ring round the flame in return chrysanthem gives Compagnul a magic fan with paintings that change at will from butterflies fluttering around cherry blossoms to outlandish monsters pursuing each other across black clouds tuki offers siku a cardboard mask representing the bloated countenance of daikok god of wealth and siku replies with a present of a long crystal trumpet by means of which are produced the most extraordinary sounds like a turkey gobbling everything is uncouth fantastical to excess grotesquely lugubrious everywhere we are surprised by incomprehensible conceptions which seem the work of distorted imaginations in the fashionable tea-houses where we finish our evenings the little serving-maids now bow to us on our arrival with an air of respectful recognition as belonging to the fast set of nagasaki there we carry on desultory conversations full of misunderstandings and endless quid pro quo of uncouth words in little gardens lighted up with lanterns near ponds full of goldfish with little bridges little islets and little ruined towers they hand us tea and white and pink coloured sweetmeats flavoured with pepper that taste strange and unfamiliar and beverages mixed with snow tasting of flowers or perfumes to give a faithful account of those evenings would require a more affected style than our own and some kind of graphic sign would have also to be expressly invented and scattered at haphazard among the words indicating the moment when the reader should laugh rather a forced laugh perhaps but amiable and gracious the evening at an end it is time to return up there oh that street that road that we must clamber up every evening under the starlit sky or the heavy thunderclouds dragging by the hands our drowsy musmes in order to regain our homes perched on high halfway up the hill where our bed of matting awaits us chapter thirteen our very tall friend the cleverest among us has been louis de s having formerly inhabited japan and made a marriage japanese fashion there he is now satisfied to remain the friend of our wives of whom he has become the komodachi taksan takai the very tall friend as they say on account of his excessive height and slenderness speaking japanese more readily than we he is their confidential adviser disturbs or reconciles our households at will and has infinite amusement at our expense this very tall friend of our wives enjoys all the fun that these little creatures can give him without any of the worries of domestic life with brother eve and little oyuki the daughter of madame prune my landlady he makes up our incongruous party chapter fourteen our pious hosts monsieur sucre and madame prune my landlord and his wife two perfectly unique personages recently escaped from the panel of some screen live below us on the ground floor and very old they seem to have this daughter of fifteen oyuki who is chrysanthem's inseparable friend both of them are entirely absorbed in the practices of shinto religion perpetually on their knees before their family altar perpetually occupied in murmuring their lengthy orisons to the spirits and clapping their hands from time to time to recall around them the inattentive essences floating in the atmosphere in their spare moments they cultivate in little pots of gaily painted earthenware dwarf shrubs and unheard-of flowers which are delightfully fragrant in the evening m sucre is taciturn dislikes society and looks like a mummy in his blue cotton dress he writes a great deal his memoirs i fancy with a paintbrush held in his fingertips on long strips of rice paper of a faint grey tint madame prune is eagerly attentive obsequious and rapacious 
her eyebrows are closely shaven her teeth carefully lacquered with black as befits a lady of gentility and at all and no matter what hours she appears on all fours at the entrance of our apartment to offer us her services as to oyuki she rushes upon us ten times a day whether we are sleeping or dressing like a whirlwind on a visit flashing upon us a very gust of dainty youthfulness and droll gaiety a living peal of laughter she is round of figure round of face half baby half girl and so affectionate that she bestows kisses on the slightest occasion with her great puffy lips a little moist it is true like a child's but nevertheless very fresh and very red chapter fifteen our dwelling is open all the night through and the lamps burning before the gilded buddha bring us the company of the insect inhabitants of every garden in the neighbourhood moths mosquitoes cicalas and other extraordinary insects of which i don't even know the names all this company assembles around us it is extremely funny when some unexpected grasshopper some free and easy beetle presents itself without invitation or excuse scampering over our white mats to see the manner in which chrysanthem indicates it to my righteous vengeance merely pointing her finger at it without another word than who said with bent head a particular pout and a scandalized air there is a fan kept expressly for the purpose of blowing them out of doors again chapter sixteen sleeping japan here i must own that my story must appear to the reader to drag a little lacking exciting intrigues and tragic adventures i wish i knew how to infuse into it a little of the sweet perfumes of the gardens which surround me something of the gentle warmth of the sunshine of the shade of these graceful trees love being wanting i should like it to breathe of the restful tranquillity of this faraway spot then too i should like it to re-echo the sound of chrysanthem's guitar in which i begin to find a certain charm for want of something better in the silence of the lovely summer evenings all through these moonlit nights of july the weather has been calm luminous and magnificent ah what glorious clear nights what exquisite roseate tints beneath that wonderful moon what mystery of blue shadows in the thick tangle of trees and from the heights where stood our veranda how prettily the town lay sleeping at our feet after all i do not positively detest this little chrysanthem and when there is no repugnance on either side habit turns into a makeshift of attachment chapter seventeen the song of the cicala forever throughout everything rises day and night from the whole country the song of the cicalas ceaseless strident and insistent it is everywhere and never-ending at no matter what hour of the burning day or what hour of the refreshing night from the harbour as we approached our anchorage we had heard it at the same time from both shores from both walls of green mountains it is wearisome and haunting it seems to be the manifestation the noise expressive of the kind of life peculiar to this region of the world it is the voice of summer in these islands it is the song of unconscious rejoicing always content with itself and always appearing to inflate to rise in a greater and greater exultation at the sheer happiness of living it is to me the noise characteristic of this country this and the cry of the falcon which had in like manner greeted our entry into japan over the valleys and the deep bay sail these birds uttering from time to time their three cries ha 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 in a key of sadness that seems the extreme of painful astonishment and the mountains around re-echo their cry chapter eighteen my friend and my doll chrysanthem eve and little oyuki have struck up a friendship so intimate that it amuses me i even think that in my home life this intimacy is what affords me the greatest entertainment they form a contrast which gives rise to the most absurd jokes and unexpected situations he brings into this fragile little paper house his nautical freedom and ease of manner and his breton accent and these tiny mousmes with affected manners and bird-like voices small as they are rule the big fellow as they please make him eat with chopsticks teach him japanese pigeon vole cheat him and quarrel and almost die of laughter over it all 
certainly he and chrysantheme take a pleasure in each other's society but i remain serenely undisturbed and can not imagine that this little doll with whom i play at married life could possibly occasion any serious trouble between this brother and me chapter nineteen my japanese relatives japanese relatives very numerous and conspicuous are a great source of amusement to those of my brother officers who visit me in my villa on the hill most especially to komodachi taksantakai the tall friend i have a charming mother-in-law quite a woman of the world tiny sisters-in-law little cousins and aunts who are still quite young i even have a poor second cousin who is a jinn there was some hesitation in owning this latter to me but behold during the ceremony of introduction we exchanged a smile of recognition it was number four hundred and fifteen over this poor number four hundred and fifteen my friends on board crack no end of jokes one in particular who less than any one has the right to make them little charles n for his mother-in-law was once a concierge or something of the kind at the gateway of a pagoda i however who have a great respect for strength and agility much appreciate this new relative of mine his legs are undoubtedly the best in all nagasaki and whenever i am in haste i always beg madame prune to send down to the gin stand and engage my cousin chapter twenty a dead fairy today i arrived unexpectedly at Diu Jinji in the midst of burning noonday heat at the foot of the stairs lay chrysantheme's wooden shoes and her sandals of varnished leather in our rooms upstairs all was open to the air bamboo blinds hung on the sunny side and through their transparency came warm air and golden threads of light today the flowers chrysantheme had placed in the bronze vases were lotus and as i entered my eyes fell upon their wide rosy cups according to her usual custom chrysantheme was lying flat on the floor enjoying her daily siesta what a singular originality these bouquets of chrysantheme always have a something difficult to define a japanese slightness an artificial grace which we never should succeed in imparting to them she was sleeping face down upon the mats her high headdress and tortoise-shell pins standing out boldly from the rest of the horizontal figure the train of her tunic appeared to prolong her delicate little body like the tail of a bird her arms were stretched crosswise the sleeves spread out like wings and her long guitar lay beside her she looked like a dead fairy still more did she resemble some great blue dragonfly which having alighted on that spot some unkind hand had pinned to the floor madame prune who had come upstairs after me always officious and eager manifested by her gestures her sentiments of indignation on beholding the careless reception accorded by chrysantheme to her lord and master and advanced to wake her pray do nothing of the kind my good madame prune you don't know how much i prefer her like that i had left my shoes below according to custom beside the little shoes and sandals and i entered on the tips of my toes very very softly to sit a while on the veranda what a pity this little chrysantheme cannot always be asleep she is really extremely decorative seen in this manner and like this at least she does not bore me who knows what may be passing in that little head and heart if i only had the means of finding out but strange to say since we have kept house together instead of advancing in my study of the japanese language i have neglected it so much have i felt the impossibility of ever interesting myself in the subject seated upon my veranda my eyes wandered over the temples and cemeteries spread at my feet over the woods and the green mountains over nagasaki lying bathed in the sunlight the cicalas were chirping their loudest the strident noise trembling feverishly in the hot air all was calm full of light and full of heat nevertheless to my taste it is not yet enough so what then can have changed upon the earth the burning noondays of summer such as i can recall in days gone by were more brilliant more full of sunshine nature seemed to me in those days more powerful more terrible one would say this was only a pale copy of all that i knew in early years a copy in which something is wanting sadly do i ask myself is the splendour of the summer only this 
was it only this or is it the fault of my eyes and as time goes on shall i behold everything around me fading still more behind me comes a faint and melancholy strain of music melancholy enough to make one shiver and shrill shrill as the song of the grasshoppers it began to make itself heard very softly at first then growing louder and rising in the silence of the noonday like the diminutive wail of some poor japanese soul in pain and anguish it was chrysanthem and her guitar awaking together it pleased me that the idea should have occurred to her to greet me with music instead of eagerly hastening to wish me good morning at no time have i ever given myself the trouble to pretend the slightest affection for her and a certain coldness even has grown up between us especially when we are alone but to-day i turn to her with a smile and wave my hand for her to continue go on it amuses me to listen to your quaint little impromptu it is singular that the music of this essentially merry people should be so plaintive but undoubtedly that which chrysanthem is playing at this moment is worth listening to whence can it have come to her what unutterable dreams forever hidden from me surge beneath her ivory brow when she plays or sings in this manner suddenly i hear someone tapping three times with a harsh and bony finger against one of the steps of our stairs and in our doorway appears an idiot clad in a suit of grey tweed who bows low come in come in monsieur kangourou you come just in the nick of time i was actually becoming enthusiastic over your country monsieur kangourou brought a little laundry bill which he wished respectfully to hand to me with a profound bend of the whole body the correct pose of the hands on the knees and a long snake-like hiss chapter twenty one ancient tombs pursuing the path that winds past our dwelling one passes a dozen or more old villas a few garden walls and then sees nothing but the lonely mountainside with little paths winding upward toward the summit through plantations of tea bushes of camellias underbrush and rocks the mountains round nagasaki are covered with cemeteries for centuries and centuries they have brought their dead up here but there is neither sadness nor horror in these japanese sepulchres it seems as if among this frivolous and childish people death itself could not be taken seriously the monuments are either granite buddhas seated on lotus or upright tombstones with inscriptions in gold they are grouped together in little enclosures in the midst of the woods or on natural terraces delightfully situated and are usually reached by long stairways of stone carpeted with moss sometimes these pass under one of the sacred gateways of which the shape always the same rude and simple is a smaller reproduction of those in the temples above us the tombs of our mountain are of an antiquity so hoary that they no longer alarm any one even at night it is a region of forsaken cemeteries the dead hidden away there have long since become one with the earth around them and these thousands of little grey stones these multitudes of ancient little buddhas eaten away by lichens seem to be now no more than a proof of a series of existences long anterior to our own and lost forever and altogether in the mysterious depths of ages chapter twenty two dainty dishes for a doll the meals that chrysanthem enjoys are something almost indescribable she begins in the morning when she wakes with two little green wild plums pickled in vinegar and rolled in powdered sugar a cup of tea completes this almost traditional breakfast of japan the very same that madame prune is eating downstairs the same that is served in the inns to travellers at intervals during the day the meals are continued by two little dinners of the drollest description they are brought up on a tray of red lacquer in microscopic cups with covers from madame prune's apartment where they are cooked a hashed sparrow a stuffed prawn seaweed with a sauce a salted sweetmeat a sugared chili chrysanthem tastes a little of all with dainty pecks and the aid of her little chopsticks raising the tips of her fingers with affected grace at every dish she makes a face leaves three parts of it and dries her fingertips after it in apparent disgust these menus vary according to the inspiration that may have seized madame prune but one thing never varies 
either in our household or in any other neither in the north nor in the south of the empire and that is the dessert and the manner of eating it after all these little dishes which are a mere make-believe a wooden bowl is brought in bound with copper an enormous bowl fit for gargantua and filled to the very brim with rice plainly cooked in water chrysantheme fills another large bowl from it sometimes twice sometimes three times darkens its snowy whiteness with a black sauce flavoured with fish which is contained in a delicately shaped blue cruet mixes it all together carries the bowl to her lips and crams down all the rice shoveling it with her two chopsticks into her very throat next the little cups and covers are picked up as well as the tiniest crumb that may have fallen upon the white mats the irreproachable purity of which nothing is allowed to tarnish and so ends the dinner chapter twenty three a fantastic funeral below in the town a street singer had established herself in a little thoroughfare people had gathered around her to listen to her singing and we three that is eve chrysantheme and i who happened to be passing stopped also she was quite young rather fat and fairly pretty and she strummed her guitar and sang rolling her eyes fiercely like a virtuoso executing feats of difficulty she lowered her head stuck her chin into her neck in order to draw deeper notes from the furthermost recesses of her body and succeeded in bringing forth a great hoarse voice a voice that might have belonged to an aged frog a ventriloquist's voice coming whence it would be impossible to say this is the best stage manner the last touch of art in the interpretation of tragic pieces eve cast an indignant glance upon her good gracious said he she has the voice of a words failed him in his astonishment the voice of a a monster and he looked at me almost frightened by this little being and desirous to know what i thought of it eve was out of temper on this occasion because i had induced him to come out in a straw hat with a turned-up brim which did not please him that hat suits you remarkably well eve i assure you i said oh indeed you say so you for my part i think it looks like a magpie's nest as a fortunate diversion from the singer and the hat here comes a cortege advancing toward us from the end of the street something remarkably like a funeral bonzes march in front dressed in robes of black gauze having much the appearance of catholic priests the principal object of interest of the procession the corpse comes last laid in a sort of little closed palanquin which is daintily pretty this is followed by a band of musmes hiding their laughing faces beneath a kind of veil and carrying in vases of the sacred shape the artificial lotus with silver petals indispensable at a funeral then come fine ladies on foot smirking and stifling a wish to laugh beneath parasols on which are painted in the gayest colours butterflies and storks now they are quite close to us we must stand back to give them room chrysantheme all at once assumes a suitable air of gravity and eve bears his head taking off the magpie's nest yes it is true it is death that is passing i had almost lost sight of the fact so little does this procession recall it the procession will climb high above nagasaki into the heart of the green mountain covered with tombs there the poor fellow will be laid at rest with his palanquin above him and his vases and his flowers of silvered paper well at least he will lie in a charming spot commanding a lovely view then they will return half laughing half snivelling and tomorrow no one will think of it again End of section 3